We are about to start um, the December uh, hearing for the Parks Committee. If you would like to testify, uh, please see the Sergeant at Arms and fill out one of these slips. So far we have three people from the Parks Department and Emily Walker from New Yorkers for Parks, and which might make for a very quick hearing. I am uh, told that we are ready to go. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. So, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Barry Gredenchik. I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation for this term of the New York City Council. At today's hearing, uh, which we are joined up by my colleague Peter Koo, representing uh, the great village of Flushing, where I grew up, uh, although not quite in this district, um, we're going to examine the overall state of the Parks Department's recreation centers when it comes to maintenance, programmatic offerings, and accessibility. The Parks Department has operated recreation centers since the turn of the 20th century, so almost 120 years now. They are a hallmark of the progressive history of this city and its efforts to provide opportunities, recreation opportunities especially, uh, for all of its residents. Today, the Parks Department operates 36 of these centers throughout the five boroughs. Recreation centers offer uh, services ranging from indoor pools and weight rooms to basketball courts, dance studios, boxing rings, art studios, game rooms, after school program, and the odd library here and there. And as a native New Yorker, I can attest to the positive influence uh, that recreation centers have in our city. I spent a lot of winters at night at the Pominock Center, which was a NYCHA center, but literally attached the hip to a New York City park, Pominock Playground. The city has long realized the value of promoting physical activity to encourage healthy living among all groups of New Yorkers. The Shape Up New York City program, for instance, offers a multitude of fitness programs at numerous recreation centers, parks, and other facilities. That's why the city should take every reasonable step it can to encourage more participa participation in physical activity and other types of recreation. Recreation centers are one of the major vehicles at the city's disposal for fulfilling that goal, and unlike many other amenities offered by the park, systems, park system, recreation centers are open year-round. During inclement weather or the winter months, they offer consistent opportunities for social interaction and recreation to many New Yorkers who otherwise could be isolated. It is therefore crucial that the city do all it can to promote its recreation centers and ensure that they are well staffed and maintained so that more New Yorkers can make use of them. In 2016, the council passed Local Law 18 to address concerns about high fees and declining attendance and membership rates. It created discounted membership tiers and fees for youths under 18, seniors, disabled persons, and veterans. These changes, changes resulted in an almost immediate uptick in attendance. This was a stark contrast from the 2011 plan that essentially doubled the admission fees at recreation centers in order to help close a $2.4 billion budget gap. The adopted plan consisted of adults paying $150, double uh, from the $75 that they had been paying uh, for centers with pools, and $100 up from 50 for centers without pools, and seniors paying $25 up from 10. Children 18 and under have continued to uh, receive free admission. These increased fees resulted in a drop in total attendance of about 65,000 visits uh, from the fiscal year 2011 to fiscal year 2012. By 2013, recreation center membership had started to rebound, and by from 2014 to 2016, membership has increased steadily. However, the most recent numbers indicate that membership and attendance numbers fell from fiscal year 2016 to this current fiscal year. For example, attendance fell from 3.6 million in 2016 to about 3.4 million in 2017, down to 3.2 million in 2018, while membership fell uh, from 162,000 in 2016 to 161,000 in 2017, down to 154,000 uh, in this year. I want to explore why there seems to have been a reversal of a recent trend, uh, what that implies for the rest of our recreation centers, and whether the decline is due to structural issues that we have to keep our eyes on. Additionally, I want to use this hearing as a step to ensuring that our recreation centers have the resources they need to maintain their levels of service 
and are able to grow in the long time, long term. So many New Yorkers rely on parks and recreation services, uh, centers for services and programs that they offer. So we have to do everything that we can to maintain a dynamic recreation environment for current and future generations of New Yorkers. I look forward to examining this issue in greater depth today, and I would this time welcome the administration to offer their testimony. Um, we have from uh, New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, Deputy Commissioner Adina Long, uh, Matt Drury, I don't remember his title, but he's very active, and Emily Chase uh, as well from Parks. And I'm going to ask uh, now my counsel, uh, Mr. Sarturi, to uh, swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? We do. Thank you. Do you two do as well? We do. You do? We okay. do. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, please, if you would bring your testimony. Good morning, Chair Gredenchik and members of the Parks and Recreation Committee. I am Emily Chase, Assistant Commissioner for Public Programs at the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm joined by Adina Long, our Deputy Commissioner for Urban Park Service and Public Programs, and Matt Drury, Director of Government Relations. Thank you for inviting us to testify today regarding the Parks Department's recreation centers. We think it would be helpful to first provide some broader context about the recreational and programming aspects of our agency's mission. The Recreation Unit at NYC Parks falls under the umbrella of the Public Programs Division, which is also comprised of aquatics, media education, puppetry, and education and wildlife, including the Urban Park Rangers. Recreation's mission is to enable all New Yorkers to lead physically active and intellectually stimulating lives through sports, fitness, outdoor adventure, technology, education, and the arts. The division's full-time headcount is approximately 500 staff, including managerial and programming staff, as well as those that provide technical support and general maintenance. Citywide, we have 36 recreation centers which are overseen by recreation. This includes our newest building, the Ocean Breeze Athletic Complex, which is an 135,000 square foot indoor track facility that hosted over 175,000 athletes at 86 competitions in 2018. The remaining 35 centers are older facilities, the oldest having been <coughs> built in 1900. Being that, that the average age of our centers is 66 years, our centers offer a diverse range in both form and function. 21 have gyms, 12 have indoor pools, and 12 feature outdoor pools. Our recreation centers far exceed neighboring commercial fitness facilities in terms of character, culture, and community. They boast pools, gyms, multi-purpose rooms, fitness rooms, media labs, indoor tracks, cardio rooms, and classrooms providing an inclusive atmosphere not often found at a typical fitness center. At NYC Parks, we seek to provide lifelong holistic enrichment, nurturing New Yorkers of all ages and abilities. We offer a wide variety of programming, from instructional sports to competitive leagues, yoga to swimming, rooftop stargazing to painting, pickleball to double dutch, chair aerobics to Zumba, concerts to lectures, roller skating to advanced Adobe design software certification training, and many more opportunities for engagement. Additionally, we provide youth of NYC an opportunity to learn, grow, and develop skills and interests through programs like swim teams, after school, summer camp, and adaptive recreation for people with disabilities. Creating these types of life-changing, soul-enriching opportunities is our focus, and it is what we do best. We further expand our ability to make these opportunities available to all by working with partner organizations to provide specialty programming for New Yorkers, collaborating with groups such as the Art Students League of New York, the Public Theater, the Jazz Foundation of America, America Jeter's Leaders, the New York Red Bulls, Madison Square Garden, and the New York Jets. As previously mentioned, we also offer opportunities for New Yorkers to enrich their interest and skills in media and technology, which is so important in this modern society and economy. The Media Education Unit of Public Programs provides high quality digital resources and creative learning opportunities in 33 media labs within recreation centers, including certification programs for Microsoft Office, video editing, editing and storytelling, photography, and STEAM aligned classes offering 3D imaging and robotics. Within the walls of our recreation center so far this calendar year, we have offered over 3,250 individual programs 
totaling over 500,000 hours of programming to approximately 150,000 Recreation Center members. In addition to programs, our Recreation Center members have access to over 1,350 pieces of fitness equipment that provide exercise and wellness opportunities in countless combinations. But at NYC Parks, we don't let brick and mortar limit our ability to provide programming. And we have a plethora of offerings for all audiences throughout the city, well beyond the confines of our recreation centers. Our mobile recreation programs, including the Playmobil and Fitness Mobile, allow us the ability to visit various community events from April through October and bring these recreational opportunities directly to New Yorkers, reaching over 25,000 people each season. One of our most popular mobile movie programs is the Movies Under the Stars program. This annual summer movie series, hosted in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, grants us the opportunity to bring unique and colorful programming to over 50,000 New Yorkers right in their local neighborhood park. By partnering with private organizations, we have been able to offer New Yorkers the chance to take part in our arts, culture, and fun program series throughout the five boroughs, including tango classes in Washington Square Park, jazz concerts in Harlem, and Tycoza drumming performances in Queens. We also offer outdoor programming in our parks that is specifically tailored to youth through our Kids in Motion and Summer Sports Experience programs. Kids in Motion engages children in active outdoor play at 101 sites citywide and had over 473,000 visits this calendar year. Similarly, similarly, the Summer Sports Experience program teaches sports skills capturing an audience of young athletic enthusiasts who are interested in further developing their skills. That program saw over 34,000 visits this year. Another successful program for children, the Puppeteers Program, has a home stage in the Swedish Cottage in Central Park and offers free mobile puppet performances and puppet making workshops citywide. Though youth programming is a priority for NYC Parks, we know that recreational opportunities are just as important for adults and seniors. Our signature fitness and wellness program that targets adults and seniors is the Shape Up NYC program. Leveraging financial support from Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield and private donors, Shape Up NYC provides free fitness programming in our parks, recreation centers, and beyond in locations all throughout the city. Since the program began in 2003, it has received over 1 million visits, which is an incredible success. This program also features a train the trainer component where members of the public have the ability to become trained fitness instructors. As part of a larger agency-wide effort to better activate our outdoor pools, this past summer, NYC Parks successfully implemented a new pilot initiative known as Cool Pools. Colorful design, art, furniture, and programming were used to reimagine and renovate five pilot outdoor pools citywide. By investing time and resources in these aging sites, we transformed traditional pool spaces into fun, vibrant and energized spaces, offering more than just swimming. Various aquatics and Shape Up NYC classes, wildlife and arts education, mobile movies, and other pop-up programs were all part of the menu of activities available at these sites, and we look forward to continuing to reactivate and re-energize our pools in the years to come. As you can hear, our recreation unit prides itself on offering a wide variety of programming to people of all ages, abilities, and interests. For that to be possible, we need to sustain our recreation facilities, ensuring that they are in the best condition possible. Therefore, the agency monitors this with specific, regular processes and benchmarks. To continually monitor the state of our recreation centers, Parks utilizes the agency's <coughs> asset management park system to store and analyze maintenance and operational information about routine upkeep, upkeep and repairs. Our recreation centers are also inspected twice a year for safety, cleanliness, and structural condition via the Recreation Evaluation and Center Assessment Program administered by the agency's Operations and Management Planning Division. In addition to dedicated maintenance staff, our playground associates can both facilitate programming as well as perform light maintenance. Many council members are familiar with the great services provided by our playground associates, as we have been able to hire up to an additional 140 seasonal employees thanks to discretionary council member funding. To help improve the physical condition of our centers, we routinely focus on quick wins, small but impactful improvements implemented to improve the quality of our recreation centers and to enhance the experience of our members. 
projects have included targeted facility improvements, improvements to a specific room in a center, or new equipment purchases. This approach allows agency leadership to prioritize our needs and inform decision making towards future investments. Beyond the everyday maintenance conducted by our staff, many of our recreation centers have received millions of dollars in capital investment during the current administration to address structural and mechanical deficiencies, upgrade fire alarms, and bring buildings up to a state of good repair. In order to properly assess all of our building's needs, a capital team of engineers and technical staff is performing a thorough assessment of each center one by one, capturing and reporting their findings through a mobile application created specifically for this purpose. Hamilton Fish in Manhattan, our oldest recreation center, is the first one to be assessed. Though the needs of many of these centers are significant, we are putting the tools in place to properly prioritize and plan for the future so they can remain robust and vital amenities for the communities they serve. Though there is much more work needed to be done, the agency has consistently invested in its recreation centers. In fiscal year 2015, Parks received $39.5 million in mayoral funding to address priority recreation center reconstruction and renovations. Utilizing these funds, seven capital projects are now underway at six facilities, including two large-scale, over $20 million, renovations to Brownsville and Hansborough Recreation Center. As recently as the last fiscal year, FY18, Parks received an additional $78 million to address priority concerns within the recreation centers, of which $34 million has been committed to facility projects citywide, including $7.1 million to upgrade or reconstruct safety measures such as fire alarm systems. These investments to our facilities are important to ensure safe and welcoming facilities for our members. NYC Parks Recreation Centers are membership-based facilities. Anyone be can become a member by submitting a complete membership registration form, the appropriate membership payment, and a government-issued ID at any one of our 36 recreation centers citywide. Annual membership fees for adults ages 25 through 61 is $150 for access to centers with indoor pools or $100 for access to centers without pools. Annual memberships for seniors ages 62 and up, veterans, people with disabilities, and young adults are discounted and only cost $25. And annual memberships for youth under age 18 are free. Additionally, New Yorkers ages 25 to 61 can receive a 10% discount for all adult memberships if they have an ID NYC card. The latest Mayor's Management Report noted a drop in both attendance and membership for our recreation centers. We believe there are a few contributing factors for those changes. Firstly, <coughs> attendance tracking includes all visitors to our facilities, including those who are simply seeking access to bathroom or other amenities without a membership. The agency has now begun enforcing our membership policy, which allows for only members to make use of the facility more strictly at our recreation centers for the safety of all of our patrons. Implementing this policy helped make our centers more secure and enjoyable for our members by helping us to better control access and allowing us to more accurately record usage in our facilities, but it clearly had an effect on attendance figures relative to past years. Second, as we strive towards upgrading our buildings and services, we are phasing out the use of our near 20-year-old membership tracking system, RecWare. While it has been useful for much of its time, its limitations that have led to discrepancies, it has limitations that have led to discrepancies in attendance counts in recent years. We are working to identify a new software vendor through the city's procurement process and look forward to be, being able to implement new membership software in the near future. This new system will have much more flexibility and functionality with regard to data capture, storage, and analysis and will be fully integrated with the park's website. Additionally, many of our recreation centers gain access to the internet through the city's wireless network, NiceWin. We do occasionally encounter connectivity outages and gaps, which can impact our ability to process memberships or track member and visitor data. We are currently assessing our connectivity needs at each site and tailoring specific data solutions where possible in each site. Lastly, success sometimes breeds new challenges. While everyone can appreciate the upgrades to our recreation facilities being delivered through quick wins and major capital projects, these projects are disruptive and inevitably lead to restricted access or closures for a given amount of time. We always seek to redirect members and, and 
programming to alternative sites when a planned closure takes place, but at times we cannot predict service disruptions. For example, emergency repair work to Roy Wilkins Pool in 2017 required several months to address, but given the sudden nature of the work required, the center unfortunately lost one of its main attractions and center attendance suffered as a result. Though they do result in a short-term loss in attendance, these closures for repairs are obviously necessary and helpful in the long term to keep these facilities in working order. In closing, we would like to reiterate the positive impact that not only our recreation centers but our entire recreation unit has made across the five boroughs. We strive to bring free and low-cost accessible programming to all New Yorkers. While these photos have given you a taste of some of our offerings, you each have a standing offer to join us at any of our recreation centers or outdoor programs. Thank you for this opportunity to share our work with you as we serve New Yorkers focusing on fun, health, and happiness. We appreciate your continued advocacy and support. We will now be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, any of my colleagues have any questions before I get into this? Uh-oh, I shouldn't have asked. Uh, Mr. Ku, go ahead. Now you go first, because I'm going to be here to the end, but I know people have other places to go at times. Thank you, even Mr. Though, Chair. Even though we all agree there's nothing more exciting yeah. than a parks and recreation hearing, so just want to put that out there. Thank you, yeah. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Department of Parks uh, for extending the swimming pool, the uh, fostering Corona Park. Uh, for another six months for those uh, uh, groups. I just received confirmation from the department. Uh, and um, forgive me, I don't know why, what was the reason that you want to um, move them out in the first, uh, in the beginning? Sure, so I, uh, so we can briefly address that. So at the uh, Flushing uh, Meadows Corona Park Aquatic Center, uh, was previously operated, uh, previous to 2014, was operated by a concessionaire, essentially as a concession. Uh, in 2014, uh, the agency reclaimed operations, central operations. So as such, there were, are, some pre-existing fee-for-service programs uh, that run counter to the, the agency's general mission of offering sort of free uh, programming. A lot of the programs, and there are wonderful organizations that offer them, but the notion that they're fee for service and the fees are actually quite considerable in many in many instances mm. uh, is rather duplicative of swim instruction, swim team program, a lot of those sort of op offerings that are already offered by the agency directly at the aquatic center. So as such, in the long term, we don't believe that fee for service, you know, uh, programs of that nature have are we don't believe that that's really the best place for them to take place. Having said that, we understand that you know. We want them to be able to find, you know, alternate locations and things like that, which is why we were proud, to, uh, happy to offer the extension for six months so that we can work out longer-term solutions. Uh, so after six months, can you duplicate the services uh, these groups provide? We believe so, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you and, know, you will, and you will provide it for free? Yes, absolutely. So our swim team programming, our, our swim instruction programming uh, are, are, are free. Um, you know, I, we understand uh, these organizations may want to have continuing conversations. We're, we're open to that, obviously. But in the long term, you know, that, that status quo, though we were happy to kind of, in, you know, indulge it for some period of time, in the long term uh, is, is untenable. Thank you. Yeah. So another thing I want to ask you is like, ping pong. Right? Ping pong is a very inexpensive uh, like program. And... Uh, and it's not only a, a, a very popular in Asian countries. It's actually very popular in Jewish people. Yeah, too, in in, Euro in European countries, you no, know, in European countries. So I want to know, like, how many facilities uh, that you guys uh, have have ping pong tables? You no, know? or do they, or do they really feel of uh, a lot of have it? We love table tennis. Yeah. We offer table tennis or ping pong at many of our facilities, uh, including Sunset Park, uh, Chelsea Recreation Center. It's a very, very popular activity. Yeah, because the reason I asked that, because uh, recently a lot of people in my community, uh, which is like Flushing area, they all come to ask me, you know, they want to find facilities uh, to pay ping pong, especially for senior citizens. And, and, and I mean, some of the senior centers, they provide one table or two tables. But uh, we want to find a good facility that they have like five tables or 
uh, that a lot of people can pay and enjoy together. Uh, so I think that is a very inexpensive uh, uh, capital improvement. It costs almost nothing. Just buy a table, a few hundred dollars, and they will bring your, their own paddles and balls. And, and don't, under, don't underestimate the, the gain of ping pong. It's really good. Uh, it has been proved to cut down Alzheimer's disease. I mean, not cut down, no, not eliminate, but decrease, right? Yeah, because you're coordination all the time, yeah. I think you have unanimous consent Support? among the members here for ping pong. Mm. Um, I, I would ask maybe uh, on behalf of Councilman Ku, I know he has the Al Orta Center in his district, so that's the closest that I know of in Flushing. Um, the one near Home Depot, right? Yeah, yeah, so maybe we can look at ping pong there. Yep. Yeah. Um, we do That's offer really good, yeah. we do offer ping pong or table tennis at El Order, yeah. and we also work to have tournaments cross borough, so we can yeah, look yeah, at perhaps yeah, yeah. involving the community at, at El Order um, in a tournament where they could compete against another borough. Yeah. The last thing I want to ask is is you know, uh, providing Wi-Fi hotspot in parks is really important. Uh, do do we have like certain hotspot in parks that uh, that you can identify and tell people, hey? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to provide Wi-Fi for the whole pond. The pond's so big. But certain pond, certain pond, uh, pond so the, um, you provide a bench, mm -hmm. and then just, hey, this is a hot spot, span, bench. So people who need to use Wi-Fi can sit down there and, and do whatever they want to do. Yeah, no, uh, internet connectivity is becoming like a, a, a very valuable amenity that people, you know, sort of seek. Uh, and so I, and there certainly is uh, Wi-Fi available at many of our park properties and, and uh to, uh, I'd have to. We'll have to get more information about how the signage works or when when that's when that's available. But uh, but yeah, we we agree. You know, uh, the flip side, of course, is that sometimes people try to get away from electronic devices and are, are less interested. But obviously, natural yeah, areas, things of that nature. Either, yeah. But where appropriate, yeah, I, I think that's something we we, uh, we we are always looking to to address. Thank you. I think your department is one of the greatest among all the agencies. Don't don't be too nice to them. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> ask probing you, questions. You provide a good service, right? And a day in the park is much cheaper than a day in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That's right? for sure. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koo, um, as always. Um, got a couple of questions for you, more than a couple. Um, you gave us the total budget. Uh, can, can you give me the total budget for uh, this part of the Department of Parks and Recreation? Our budget is approximately thirty million for staffing and two point seven million for OTPS. That includes recreation, media education, and aquatics. Does that include nights and movies and all that? Does that en encapsulate everything? No, maybe. Yes. Uh, that's that's sort of baseline agency funding. That okay. wouldn't include uh, the significant discretionary funding that's that's so provided through movie, the generosity. Those movie nights you're talking about are funded by people like us. <laughs> Many are funded through the agency, okay, so some of I that think. is included, but it's, it's uh, uh, yes, yeah, sort of added value. We're able to, have to expand and, and okay. you know, sort of augment those, those investments as well, thanks to the support of the council. Okay, and I know in the past there were layoffs or uh, maybe people weren't hired back due to budget cuts. Have we gotten back to where we were prior to the difficulties that we had? Uh, headcount in general has essentially uh, regained, uh, is, is, is now essentially at par with its, its previous peaks. I think it's following uh, in the early 2000s, there were, yeah, there were some significant uh, dips and cuts, but the agency, generally speaking, writ large, has, has uh, regained those, those, those positions back. Okay. And you had member, uh, mentioned in your testimony that um, one of the reasons that uh, attendance is down is because there's a, a stricter enforcement policy now so that um, we obviously uh, our rec centers are in closed places and um, we want to make sure that uh, public uh, can recreate safely so you've been you have been using uh, a stricter enforcement <coughs> policy in terms of if, you, if you're not a member you're not coming in um, are there any other reasons that um, that you have identified that there is a decline and if and is there one set of people, younger people, older people, um, you know, people with a disability, veterans? Are any discernible patterns there? 
Well, membership and attendance has declined. Uh, we do currently have 150,000 members, and we had over 3 million visits to our centers in FY18. Um, a couple of notable things that we think are contributing factors in terms of uh, attendance and membership. Um, as I said, we are phasing out the use of our nearly 20-year-old membership tracking system, RecMare. It has its limitations. It's led to discrepancies in attendance counts in recent years. So we're working to identify a new software vendor through the city's procurement process and look forward to be able, being able to implement new membership software in the near future. And, and we are hopeful that this new system will have much more flexibility and functionality, which will allow us to better track members and attendees. Can you give us a, just a little bit about how that software was, I mean, it's 20 years old, so I mean, I'm almost 59 now, you got me worried, so maybe things don't work so well as they get older, but can you give us a limita an idea of the limitations? I assume that this software has been augmented from time to time over 20 years, but I guess now it's just reached the end of its usefulness. Yeah, and there are certain features that are, are a bit cumbersome. So for instance, we had identified a button that was essentially allowing us to track visitors that entered the facility for a large event. So say you have a, a huge track and field meet or a basketball tournament and you have large numbers of people flowing into the facility. You could hit a multiple of 10 rather than hitting one. And that function functionality was not clear. So we had to adjust that in, in uh, when we identified that some of our staff were using that incorrectly, we had to make an adjustment. It's, it's the, the system, in short, is cumbersome and difficult to use. Time to move on. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Would you say, you know, one of the things that I learned, I've learned as parks chair of almost a year now, is that um, parks are much stronger as a sum of many, many different pieces. and. We could go on and on and probably dozens and dozens of different things that people come to a park for, um, whether it's, you know, a big park like Central Park, or Cunningham Park and Alley Pond in my district, or the corner playground, you know, that dots uh, most of New York City. Um, so it's fair to say that recreation centers are kind of like, for some people, what a bocce court would be or a tennis court, because even though they offer a wide variety of services, some people that visit rec centers may not go to another park facility. You find that to be true? Yes, these are most certainly community hubs. People come to socialize, to relax, to take a break, to get out of their homes. Um, we welcome passive recreation, especially for our seniors in our recreation centers. These are these are home homes away from home for a lot of New Yorkers. I would, I yes, the, the, the ones I've seen I was especially intrigued at the one at Thomas Jefferson Park, which is just oof, busy. Um, and it had bumper pool, which I haven't seen since I was about eight years old, so uh, it's been a while. Um, we have um, noted in, in my question list a number of centers that are currently closed for maintenance or construction issues including Herbert Von King Center in Brooklyn, the St. John's Recreation Center in Brooklyn as well, uh, the Tony Dapolito Center in Manhattan, and the Sorrentino Center in Queens, as well as, um, you kind of mentioned your testimony, uh, Roy Wilkins Park. Um, can we talk about the status updates on, on when we might expect to see these open again? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, we look to avoid all types of closures to our recreation centers uh, when repair is needed in order to cause the least amount of disruption to our members. So our member access to our centers is of the utmost importance. Um, in, and just to make the distinction, not all of the ones you mentioned are fully closed, but I can, I can go through that now. Um, Von King Center in Brooklyn is closed doing due to an ongoing capital project, uh, renovations to a multi-purpose performance space, and we're- The whole our, center is closed? The whole center okay. is closed. And our Parks Capital Division is anticipating completion in winter or spring of 2019. Uh, at St. John's Recreation Center in Brooklyn, the facility is closed due, in, due to an ongoing capital project, the HVAC, and we are anticipating completion in winter of 2019. Um, Tony Dapolito is- Does that is, mean oh, this coming winter? <laughs> or yes, yeah, in, a, in just a couple months. Okay, we hope. okay. I want to make sure we're on the same page. Absolutely. Uh, 
Tony Dapolito Recreation Center in Manhattan is open. Um, it was just closed very briefly okay. uh, due to emergency boiler work. We're making progress, good. And Sorrentino Recreation Center in Queens, it's not completely closed at all, but because of ongoing capital work, certain portions of the facility have been closed at various times. And the Roy Wilkins, is it just a pool at Roy? It's the one that I'm really familiar with. They have a great pool there. They have a small weightlifting area. They have a large gymnasium. So this facility is open. And, however, it's been undergoing capital improvements uh, since March of 2018. And they're experiencing a number of upgrades, a new roof over the gym being one of them. And so some programming spaces and areas of the building are need to be close to complete that work. Okay. It's an old building. I know it was a military uh, facility before it was the park. And just to add, we do update the website when there are specific closures to spaces within the facility um, or if the entire facility requires closure. So we lean on our website to get information out to our constituents. I want to go back to membership a little. Um, we noted earlier in, in my opening statement um, a decline after the, the fee increase in 2011. Are you seeing other reasons? So you have you, uh, you know, it's a, these, these centers are obviously extremely important to the city. Um, over three million visitors, which is an awful lot of people, and, and 150,000 regulars. So the the question that I have, we seen competition from you know private services or. Is there anything that we could be doing to um, enhance the experience? I know there's always more that we can be doing, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that people have been telling you that you haven't told me yet. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Commissioner. So um, we can appreciate the, uh, the concept that we have competition uh, with other commercial entities. However, we see our rec centers as being much more than um, a, a fitness uh, entity that you might uh, spend ten dollars a month on, uh, because of all of the programs that we've mentioned previously: um, the after-school summer camp, the kids in motion programming, senior programming, adaptive programming, our pools, our gyms. And you, and you even have competition from other city agencies. We have Beacon programs, right? So I mean, there's other, there are social uh, service agencies that are funded by the city. Honestly, we see them more as a supplemental than competition. Uh, we are not necessarily competing for the same funds. Um, and certainly, there's enough demand in the city uh, for all of us to be um, helping in that regard. OK. Well, if it was up to me, every school would be open pretty much from 6 AM to midnight. But that's another story uh, for another hearing. Um, Does the Department of Parks and Recreation have a single budget line for these centers, or are they spread out over a number of lines, or how does that work? All revenue collected from all the recreation centers uh, for recreation goes into one budget code and revenue source. And. I'm assuming that we're subsidizing these centers, that the fees are not getting anywhere close to. It's, it's fine. I mean, we got plenty of money, um, fortunately, right now. Not enough, but, you know, it's, it's what we do, and we want people to um, enjoy. So you want to say something, man? No, yeah, just just confirming that, you know, we think the, the current fee structure is, is reasonable, uh, extremely reasonable and, and provides, you know, great access. You know, these these are, you know, annual fees, obviously 150 uh, for centers with a pool, 100, you know, for those without for an annual fee, we believe. And that's for adults, not to mention all the various, uh, you know, discounts and other programs that uh, folks have described. Uh, so we believe it's really wonderful. Okay. I just want to announce that the Bronx has joined us. Uh, we've been joined by Councilman Andrew Cohn. And council member as well, uh, Mark Joni. Gentlemen, you. have any questions? The Bronx has always been here. You have? Well, I don't want to know. I'd be happy to give it to you right now. I'll just pipe in that uh, uh, you know I have a rec center in the Williamsbridge Oval, and Sarah is the director. I don't know Sarah's last name, but I have to say she is incredibly committed and really I think does you know she has limited resources, but she really stretches them and and really makes the programming there attractive. Uh, and she's a, re you know, I mean, really, I think, really the heart of that particular rec center. So I just want to, as long as we're on the record here, I want to give her a shout out because I think she does tremendous work. Thank, Thank you. you. That's Sarah Bichelle. Yes. 
Thank you. It's always good to hear good things about our parks. Mr. Joni, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, is there any other, if you had your druthers, would there be other discounted memberships? Is there anything we're missing that we should think about in future, future budget years? Um, actually, we think the current fee structure uh, per, per, uh, represents a, a fair and, and uh, appropriate uh, cross-section. Okay. I um, wanted to get in. I'll come back to my questions, but I... In your testimony on page three, you mentioned that um, anybody can become a member uh, by uh, submitting a completed membership form and payment and a government-issued ID. What happens for people that don't have a government-issued ID? I know we have the New York City ID program now, but not everybody wants to take advantage of that. And I'm just wondering if we've had to turn away people from that and whether it's something we should be looking at. Yeah, we'd have to get back to you in, in terms of how often that that you know comes up. But because especially because we do accept ID NYC, you know, I believe the you know the 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 intent here is obviously just to you know proof of residency, right? So I you know to the degree that, uh, and we're always happy to partner with organizations to get word more word out about ID NYC. But that as as you know, and on, on other folks, you know, if it's a driver's license or other forms, like that's fine as well. But um, okay. but we have not seen that uh, as a tremendous uh, hurdle or, or burden. Okay. I, I, I haven't either, but I just wanted to ask that question. And can, I don't know if you did it, but can you tell me the number of events that take place in the New York City? Are all the events, now I, I understand there are different kinds of events. There's puppet shows, right? And there's movies. Um, there's the Philharmonic, which can draw, you know, 50 or 100,000 people, depending, about 7,000 people in, in my park, Cunningham Park. But I'm just wondering if you can tell me how many different events there are in New York City parks a year. And I know it's a staggering number. Exact amount. I want the exact amount. <laughs> Mr. Borelli will not be satisfied otherwise. You can get back to me. I'd love to know the answer because it, you know, as parks chair, um, Commissioner Silva calls himself the commissioner of fund, so I guess that makes me the chairman of fund. So, um, not as much fun as zoning and franchises, Mr. Moya, but almost as much. But um, it's something that I'm curious about um, because we always would like to increase your budget, and I'm going to make a major push for that in the coming uh, 2020 uh, fiscal year budget. But that would be helpful to see, you know, and, I, and it's also good for us just to know so we have an idea of exactly what's going on. Um, we have kind of a handle on the number of visitors to New York City parks, which is currently pegged at 130 million a year, although I would argue it's probably more based on the numbers just from Central Park being 40 million um, and our beaches being, you know, upwards of 20 million. So I would be curious to, to get, if not today, then in, in the coming days or weeks, uh, a breakdown on exactly how many events there are um i you know i know every day there are event, everything that you do um i would be very curious to see that and maybe a lot um more than we think and i think parks if that's the case then parks should be getting credit for that so commissioner if you want to take a, a small stab at it well um i i want to you're right, we do a lot of events, and recreation in and of itself does many events, not only self-generated events, but we also partner with, uh, with many of the council members on sure. providing events uh, for their districts um, in, and in their communities. Above and beyond that, and, and we will get back to you on, on real numbers, but I thought it important to make this distinction, um, is that we have park administrators and we have uh, park groups and we have uh, other p permitted events that occur in our park. So it's really sort of coming from many different sources. Right, and that's I why I didn't, I didn't really expect you to have an answer today. But I think it would be a good thing for us to know, um, simply because we should know what's going on, and, and that's part of my responsibility. But I, th I think it also uh, helps us to make a case for how important our parks are, and I think um, certainly everybody here recognizes that, and, and most New Yorkers, if not all New Yorkers, um, understand how important our parks are there. As I often say, 
our parklands in by themselves are larger than the borough of the Bronx, which is uh, pretty impressive because you know the Bronx is over 42 square miles. So uh, that's something to chew on. But if it's it's not just a number of people, but I, I really would like to know exactly how many events are occurring from from small things, you know, little puppet shows to to the Philharmonic, um, which may be the biggest events that happen in parks every year. But and we also, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on. Um, you know, I'm not talking about baseball games and all that, but stuff done under the aegis of, of the Parks Department, um, working with other agencies or community groups. And like Certainly, that. we understand, and we'll work to get those okay. numbers too. I appreciate that very much. Um, Mr. Jonah, I missed that. We've been joined by Eric Ulrich of Queens. We're, uh, you have any questions, Mr. Ulrich? I just got here. I, okay, I'll let you decompress a little. I, okay. Um, you mentioned before um, that recreation centers are kind of hubs for, for communities. Do, does the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation lever leverage its centers um, for social services and benefits outreach, especially for, uh, of course, the people that use the center uh, who may be in other forms of, uh, need other forms of social assistance, uh, such as casework or et cetera. Uh, yes, I think in, in some in some targeted uh, efforts, uh, certainly, for example, voter registration forms uh, per, per local law are made available at our recreation centers as they are at other sort of more traditional service uh, agency hubs uh, throughout the city. Um, also, I believe, you know, when, uh, in the midst of the NYC and uh, the, uh, the IDNYC launch, you know, our, our, some of our centers served as uh, hubs for, for signups and things of that nature. So, uh, our, again, as they are gathering uh, community points, you know, uh, our centers have been utilized uh, in that way in, in many forms and fashion, though, though they're, our, primary, our primary mission, of course, is the sort of uh, recreation, uh, social and physical uh, recreation benefits that, that occur there. Okay. Um, dis disabil disability access, people with disabilities, are our centers all handicap accessible? Programming inclusion and access to our buildings for people with disabilities is something that the agency takes very seriously. Our capital projects and citywide services divisions have scheduled and completed important work to make our recreation centers more ADA compliant in areas that needed minor ADA upgrades um, to the interior based on previous ins inspections. All of our recreation centers currently have accessible entrances <coughs> and pathways leading to them. And we're really, really proud of our ongoing adaptive sports programming for children, teens, and adults with disabilities due to our interior and exterior ADA accommodation, accommodations, which allow us to offer these programs and to sure. offer a consistent level of service to those with disabilities. Um, we also have um, Christopher Noel, the agency's accessibility coordinator, who's been instrumental in the agency's work in this area. He works very closely with our capital team to design with accessibility at the forefront of their minds. And we believe we would rate high on a scale of 1 to 10 in regard to providing overall disability access. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, how often do you inspect the centers for cleanliness? And, and to make sure that everything is in proper working order. And is there a reporting mechanism? How, how does it, when you have a problem, when something's broken, how does it get fixed? So um, as an agency, we take great deal and, and pride in the work that goes into keeping our centers uh, clean, safe, and functional, and making them enjoyable spaces for our uh, customers to play, learn, and train. Uh, the centers are inspected at least twice for each tour of duty. So if we have two shifts that are working in a center, uh, they're being inspected at least twice. Um, beyond that, uh, mentioned in our testimony is the what we refer to as the RECAP program, which is a version of the Parks Department's PIP program, which you're probably more familiar with. Uh, RECAP inspects each of our 36 rec centers twice a year. There are 12 features that are uh, uh, rated, that were rated upon. And so we receive uh, the, those ratings in terms of inspection. They look at both structural cleanliness and other, so that also helps inform decision making as it relates to any sort of aesthetic improvements we have to make as well as any physical improvements in capital projects. 
And if something breaks, you have in, generally in-house or? I know we have Dr. Playground. I've seen Dr. Playground around, but I'm just wondering if you have <laughs> Dr. Rec Center. So we have uh, varying levels of uh, maintenance and operations staff that are assigned to our centers. Uh, so certain levels of cleanliness in terms of keeping clean uh, can, is done in-house, but we work hand-in-hand -hand with our maintenance and operations trades division and citywide services trades divisions to address larger repairs and other issues. Okay. Mr. Jonah, did you have a question? Thank you, Chairman. One of the six rec centers in the Bronx, um, Owen Dolan Recreational Center, which is a true hub um, and offers so much to uh, Bronxites, a portion of that facility is being used by personnel for Parks Department. Confined space, limited space. Um, I've brought this up in the past having Parks Department occupy a portion of a recreational center is counterproductive, especially when the demand and the limited space that we currently have indoors. I wonder if this is throughout the other rec centers. And my real concern here is that the staff keeps equipment there, which could actually be hazardous to the well-being of the rec center and those that participate there. Flammable items, machinery filled with gas, storage of other liquids that could be very dangerous and harmful. Thank you, council member. Um, so with regards to Owen Dolan, uh, I'm aware of the situation in which you speak. That there is one wing that is used for maintenance and operations, district operations. Um, I can have a conversation with Borough Commissioner Rodriguez Rosa regarding uh, an alternative space for that staff. Um, but in terms of your the second part of your question, uh, our recreation centers are as disparate uh, as they are alike in, in terms of function. Uh, while we do have some multi-million dollar, 135,000 square foot centers, uh, many of our facilities are field houses that have been repurposed, and in some cases, even comfort stations that have been repurposed. Um, so sharing of space between recreation and maintenance and operations is, is quite frankly not that unusual, but with regards to the equipment, we can certainly address that. That would be space that can be utilized uh, for the betterment of the rec center and offer more programs and services. There's a demand for it, it's obvious. Uh, and I know that it may not be easy to relocate park staff and finding an ideal location for them, but certainly not at our rec center, uh, <coughs> especially one at this rec center, since you're familiar with it, is so small. Uh, and every square foot makes a difference on programming. We appreciate your concern and interest. And again, I'll speak with the borough commissioner and see how we might be able to address the situation. And for the record, I'm very fond of my borough commissioner. I love her. We'll be sure to let her know that. Thank you. We're all fond of Iris, so. Um, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Costantanidis. Um, if you have any questions, Council Member, just let me know. Um, when you have a rec center that might not meet cleanliness standards, um, is there a process for do you shut it down? What do you do? It's, you know, Obviously, people in close quarters, we want to make sure these places are clean. Is there, um, I don't know if you've had this issue, but I'm just curious, you know, we have a lot of people, millions, three million people a year moving in and out, and we have, you know, swimming pools and people sweating and, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, we take the cleanliness of our facilities um, uh, very, very seriously. Um, it is really one of the things that you expect as a client of a public facility to be in a safe, clean environment. So um, generally, we just take corrective action. Um, if for some reason uh, we don't have appropriate staff assigned to the center, then we will reassign staff or request staff from uh, the district to come and assist us. But it's generally taken care of right away. Okay. Um, the PEP officers, do are they 
ever assigned, or are they on a on a tour of the district, or you know, how does that work with in uh, making sure that we have safety? So we have a, approximately a dozen PEP officers and three PEP sergeants that are assigned to recreation centers citywide. Uh, in addition to that, we have approximately 47 park security service officers that are assigned to centers. And during the winter, we, have a, we fluctuate an additional 50 or so odd uh, staff come surge into our centers because it's a little bit too cold for them to be on foot post uh, out in the, in the parks. Uh, so there is uh, park security coverage at our facilities. I should note that the park security officers are not shielded, so they're unable to write summonses or to uh, effect arrests. Uh, but they do serve a wonderful and a very important role in being the eyes and the ears right. and serving, uh, doing customer service and so on. And do you track uh, crimes or the number of violations that occur? I know it's not a big issue, but I'm just curious. So we do track incidents that occur in our rec centers, um, and we have a... a reported 432 incidents in the last year that were reported in or around the recreation center. Oftentimes we'll include incidents that occurred in a park if the rec center is actually uh, located within a park. The complaint types include locker break-in, thefts, assaults, graffiti, and vandalism. Okay. Um, can you tell me what the, the average opening hours of a center are? We have a range of, o of opening hours at our centers. Um, some open as early as 6 or 6.30 a.m. and some close as late as um, 10 p.m. And we have a handful that are open on Sundays, uh, about 10 I believe, and most are open um, every you know, six days a week. Um, are there any nuke centers being constructed or contemplated? Uh -huh. okay. So uh, we are currently in conceptual design phase for the Tilden Recreation Center, also known as the Shirley, Shirley Chisholm Recreation Center in East Fl Flatbush, Brooklyn. Is that a new center or? It will be a new center. A new building? Yes, sir. Not a bathroom? <laughs> Full scale. <laughs> Uh, upwards of uh, upwards of thirty thousand square feet. So that's pretty big. That's yes. pretty large. Um, uh, Mr. Costantinides, you had a question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Grudenchik. I uh, appreciate it, and good to see you all. Um, so I have a question about rec centers. Um, what are the breakout per borough? There are six in the Bronx, eight in Brooklyn, four on Staten Island, 13 in Manhattan, and eight in Queens. Eight in Queens. Um, how many in Western Queens? Um, I'm not as familiar with Queens, but I can name the centers. Okay, well, the, I mean, it gets the question that I what's have. The, what's it, the answer? Because you probably know the yeah. answer. <laughs> It's zero. Okay. Um, so I mean, I, th I think that there's been a call for a community center, a rec center in Western Queens. What is the park's capacity to add um, new rec centers or have out look for opportunities to add one as we have things going on in our communities? Uh, 
Yeah, expanding uh, the park's portfolio, acquisitions of any type, are always something that the agency looks carefully at, working with Mayor's Office and OMB. As you can understand, it's it's certainly something as you know massive as a new recreation center can can be a real challenge. But it's something we're constantly taking a look for those opportunities. And how do you fund? How would you you know? Is it in partnership with something a, a nonprofit in the community? Do you do it just sort of standalone? How, what is the sort of the best model if we were to sort of like build one up from scratch? Traditionally, acquisitions and and construction has has been funded you know centrally and mayorally, but. I believe the city remains open to to a, to a variety of different. Well, I mean, the capital you know, I get, but once once you're actually running it, like, what's the best way to actually sort of have staffing and and that, the, things of that nature? Yeah, again, I think traditionally, you know, baseline, you know, agency funding okay. is, is is traditionally the best, you know, the model that we've seen in place. Well, I know that you know we, you know, have a lot of really great things happening in our parks in Western Queens. Uh, very excited about the Anchor Park program. Very excited that we've been able to either fund or uh, see the renovation of half the parks and playgrounds in, our di- in, in my district. Um, but the, and we're looking to finish that loop before I'm done. Uh, but we are looking for a rec-, a rec space, and it's something that the community really needs. And we, I luckily would hope to have the opportunity to sit down with, with you and, and talk about opportunities to sort of make that happen. Yeah, we'd welcome that conversation, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Is that going to come off the $30 million that we're spending in Astoria Park? No, I'm going to ask for more. Oh, okay. <laughs> as long as I, I just wanted to be clear on that. Uh, Mr. Jonah, you had another question? Yeah, speaking about fairness and equity, how many pools do we have in New York City? Public pools, you mean? Public pools, yes. <coughs> indoor and outdoor? Yeah. Is it one Approximately uh, 66. That's a combination of both indoor and outdoor. I mean, do you know the breakdown by borough? Unfortunately, I don't. We'll have to get that to you. Do you know how many are there are in the 13th council district, that very important area of the Bronx? Oh, one of, of our city. favorites, certainly. He has um, his own beach, though, just just for the record. Orchard, obviously, Orchard Beach is a jewel, a, you know, a jewel in the crown of the New York City uh, beach system, of course. Uh, but as as to, as to pools uh, by council district, we, we'll have to get that to you as well. So I'll answer that. Zero. I have um, one pool, but it's your car is larger than. Very small. Council member, it's not always about you. Sometimes yes, it it's is. about me. It's about my constituents, uh, about not about me. <laughs> Never about me. I would really, perhaps this is a good opportunity, Chairman, to start calling for a hearing in the future when it comes to uh, outdoor, indoor pools uh, that are not afforded to uh, all uh, city residents. Um, and we're fortunate to have the Beach and uh, Orchard Beach in particular and the uh, shoreline. But certainly nothing is more comforting than a pool in a controlled environment, especially for the younger swimmers and um, the parents that we have in the families. Um, and there's plenty of space in the uh, third. You don't have to acquire anything. Uh, we have 2,700 acres at Pelham Bay Park. Maybe you heard about it, uh, that we can find a little corner to actually put a pool in, I think would go a long way to serve uh, and improve the quality of life that um, Bronx sites should enjoy and be entitled to. Uh, we're, we're always open to the conversation about the creation of new amenities. Obviously, a lot of complications come into factors, making sure that our, our parks have a diversity of use. But but your point, well taken, and uh, you know, obviously it's something we'd be happy to sit down and talk about. Chairman, will you make this a priority for us? Um, Three o'clock. <coughs> we'll have it done. It is. It is an important priority. Uh, it should be. Uh, we we sometimes forget that we do live in one of the largest uh, port cities in the world, um, New York Harbor, Great Natural Harbor. Uh, we have tremendous uh, public beaches, the Rockaways, uh, world famous Coney Island, Orchard Beach, uh, which my mother used in the 30s um, and the 40s. Uh, as well as uh, the south shore of Staten Island, which is pretty much one long beach. Um, we don't have one in Manhattan yet, although there were suggestions made in the media, I think, earlier this year. Um, but um, it is important, I think, and it's, it's extremely important um, that our young people especially learn how to swim. So. Uh, from that idea alone, I think it, uh, Councilman Joe Nye has raised a very valid point. And speaking of water, um, I had the opportunity um, to tour Baruch Playground uh, earlier this year, which is on the Lower East Side in uh, Councilmember Carlina Rivera's district. And I noticed um, the bathhouse there, and I don't know 
where the bathhouses come under the recreation divisions, uh, I don't know what the right word, Suzanne, I can't even pronounce that word, under your uh, aegis. Because, <laughs> as you probably know, this building has been closed to the public for 40 years. Um, and it has a green roof because there are trees growing out of it now. Um, so it's a naturally occurring green roof. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if there are any plans, uh, whether it needs to be demolished and started over. It's probably a very old building, um, but it obviously could be a tremendous amenity to the people who live there, many of whom live in public housing. Uh, yes, um, absolutely. We're, you know, the, the, it's a, the, the history of the structure, as you mentioned, uh, and, the, and the structural conditions, you know, the fact that there is literally, uh, you know, uh, trees and, and uh, other uh, natural area, uh, natural elements sort of literally growing out of, out of the building now. So uh, our, I, I believe there, I don't know that there's been a recent structural uh, assessment uh, but we have, I, in the process of releasing a, a, a request for uh, expressions of interest in terms of reactivating the space, and, and I believe that's been that's been released. And so, I uh, I'll have to check on the status of that process, whether we've received any any uh, re responses. Um, so I'm, I'm not a structural engineer, but I, I I believe the anecdotal understanding is is demolition may certainly be necessary. Okay, I mean, and I assume that it is monitored uh, monitored so. Um, it doesn't collapse. We unfortunately have had some building collapses in the city. It's a very old structure. Um, I don't know how old, but um, I just wanted to put that out there because it's a parks facility. Um, I know there's a lot of money earmarked for that park, um, which is probably one of the less desirable recreation spaces in the city of New York currently. I'm sure it will be much better when it's redone. Um, but I just wanted to bring that forward because uh, we are talking about recreation centers. Certainly, and it's something that's very much on our on our radar. Okay, Mr. Jonai, Mr. Costa. Oh, uh, you said sixty-three or sixty-six pools, indoor outdoor. I believe it's sixty-six, combination of indoor and outdoor. We have fifty-one council members, so you have a council member here that does not have one, which means there are council members which enjoy the privileges of having several pools. Um, Chairman, I, I'm requesting on record that we have a hearing on fairness and fair share and equity citywide, no pool. I think the residents and the children of 13 council districts should learn how to swim in a controlled environment. Well, we do have Orchard Beach. We could pen off a piece of that and we could do swimming lessons I'm there. A floating I mean, pool. A floating I'm okay pool. with that also. Uh, or not floating pool, but we could, you know, use an area that would be, you know, sectioned off um, and uh, because... Some people, not me, but some people would argue that you probably have more parkland than any other council member in the city of New York. So more than my thousand plus acres in one park. More parkland that needs to be maintained year round. Well, and I'm looking forward to have the funding or we can divert some of the parkland to your district. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to you being a strong ally as we look to increase parks budget to have more maintenance and, and other things that uh, we need. Um, I think I am done uh, asking questions, and I want to thank you for your forthrightness and for being here today. And um, as I always do at this point, I would ask that uh, you stick around. I don't think this hearing is going much longer because Emily Walker, who is the only person signed up, unless Lynn Kelly is going to join her or she's going to solo today, or okay, that's okay. What's ever up to you know? We're always happy to have Miss Walker who. It's a great advocate for parks. Thank you all. Thanks, bro. No? All right. Ms. Walker? Yes. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you, Chair Grudenchik. Um, good afternoon. My name is Emily Walker, and I am the Director of Outreach and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. I would like to thank the City Council Committee on Parks and Recreation for inviting us to speak on the importance of our city's recreation centers today. 
The city's 36 recreation centers are a critical resource for New Yorkers, particularly in low-income neighborhoods where obesity and asthma rates are high and residents have limited options for recreation and fitness. In addition to the bricks and mortar facilities managed by NYC Parks, recreation programming run through the agency provides a wealth of opportunities for New Yorkers of all ages and abilities to improve health outcomes and build community. Although the agency may no longer highlight recreation in its name, we believe this component of the agency's mandate is an incredibly important service provided to New Yorkers and is one worth investing in. More and more, public health experts are acknowledging the key role that our parks play in improving public health outcomes. This idea has even caught on in the form of park prescriptions from healthcare professionals to encourage patients to engage in healthy outdoor recreation as a means for treating physical and mental health issues. In a city where we experience inclement weather throughout the year, the indoor recreation centers offered by our parks department will play a critical role long-term in improving public health outcomes throughout New York City. In 2013, we testified before this committee to share our concerns that the new membership pricing structure would, be, would preclude many of New York's lower income residents from being able to take advantage of our public recreation centers. The agency's response at that time to implement lower cost membership levels for young adults and seniors was a meaningful way to address some of the inequities raised by the increased membership rate. Additional reduced rate memberships for New Yorkers with disabilities and veterans have also been a positive change in reaching more New Yorkers, as is the discount offered to IDNYC holders. We do still have concerns that the current membership rate for adults may be cost prohibitive for many low-income New Yorkers, however, and may have the unintended effect of contributing to a drop in overall attendance and membership at our public recreation centers. For the nearly 2 million New Yorkers living below the poverty line, the ability to pay a $150 or $150 upfront fee for a year membership or even $75 or $50 for a half year membership may be completely out of reach. We also want to note that the requirement to prove residency may be prohibitive for those in transitional housing or those experiencing homelessness. A look back at recent mayor's management reports from the past four fiscal years shows a downward trend in membership and attendance at rec centers. From the recent high point in FY16, there has been the steady decline in both membership and attendance, and the MMR for FY16 in particular states that the increase in both membership and rec center attendance for that year could be attributed to the opening of the state-of-the-art Ocean Breeze facility in Staten Island. We are concerned that the momentum from that year may have been lost and is an indicator that the city needs to take a more comprehensive look at the factors that imp impact New Yorkers' ability and willingness to become members and regular users of this critical open space amenity. Um, again, recent M MMRs also point out that drops in attendance and membership can be in part attributed to temporary closures of recreation centers undergoing major capital renovations, and that was highlighted by the agency today in their testimony. Um, with rec centers relatively few and far between in the city of 8.5 million New Yorkers, that is an understandable outcome. We believe capital renovations for our rec centers, over half of which were built prior to 1950, are essential to the long-term usability of these spaces, and we encourage the city to proactively take on these renovations as funding allows. We do caution, however, that this work be done in a thought thoughtful and pragmatic way. Um, we'd like to use the neighborhood of Brownsville, Brooklyn as a quick example of why. Um, the in our recently published Brownsville Open Space Index report, we found that the neighborhood residents um, disproportionately in that community suffer from poor health outcomes, and that young residents in particular are in need of safe spaces to engage in healthy recreation and activity. We view our parks and rec centers as key to improving such outcomes, but in Brownsville, two of these critical recreation resources are about to be temporarily unavailable for a period of time, as both the Brownsville Recreation Center and Betsy Head Park are slated for major capital renovations. Um, temporarily losing these two critical park amenities will mean that the residents and youth of Brownsville will have even fewer opportunities for free, safe, or low or no cost programming um, that is vitally needed. And we believe it's when these assets are not available that their public benefit is most magnified. Finally, we want to note that in order for our recreation centers to be a realistic option for active recreation, they must be kept clean and in a good state of repair. The FY19 MMR found that 83% of city recreation centers rated acceptable for overall condition. And while this was a slight increase over the FY18 findings, it still falls short of the city's stated goal of 85% of centers being rated acceptable. 
NY4P believes that our public parks and recreation centers must be clean and well-maintained to convey maximum public benefit, and we encourage the administration and the council to ensure that critical maintenance and operations resources are being allocated in the expense budget for parks to ensure that our centers are being kept to the highest standard of condition possible. The ability for New Yorkers to take advantage of our public recreation centers and programming is an equity issue that we believe warrant that we believe warrants closer attention, and we hope today's hearing is one way to help address that issue. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I welcome any questions you may have. I thank you uh, for your testimony, and as always, it's it's uh, good to see the team from New Yorkers for Parks. Um, I have been to Betsy Head, which is one of the best playgrounds in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. And I know that it is also uh, an anchor park mm -hmm. and will be receiving, um, along with four other parks, including Astoria Park, uh, which I was thinking of earlier. Um, but I, I, I don't know that the whole park is going to close um, because I think that this, the section of Betsy Head, which is going to receive upgrades, is on the other side uh, away from the absolutely stunning playground that is there. But mm -hmm. um, And if you haven't been to see it, just... You know, I don't know how often you, you get out to central Brooklyn, but it's spectacular. It's just really uh, one of my favorite playgrounds in the city. I haven't seen them all, but uh, the work that was done there. And Commissioner Moore was like a, a kid in a candy shop uh, showing me it. Uh, it's just spectacular. It even has a sandbox, which is not usual for a New York City park these days. So uh, really just spectacular. Um, I don't have anything else for you. I don't know if any of the other members... Mr. Costa, we have been joined by um, uh, Justin Brannan of Southern Brooklyn um, and also Jimmy Van Bramer, who had another big hearing today, uh, did join us as well. Um, and I appreciate um, your testimony here. We will certainly put that into the record. Thank you, Councilman. And uh, this is last call. Uh, all right. Um, in that case, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we will be having hearings, of course, coming up in uh, January and February before we get to the preliminary hearing on the mayor's budget. Um, right now, I am expecting to hold with Councilman Costantanidis and the Committee Environmental Protection a hearing on uh, resiliency in Lower Manhattan Parks. Um, there has been a plan put forward by the administration um, for $1.45 billion um, in resiliencies to be woven into our park system. And we understand in many cases our parks are on the front lines um, as we try to coexist with Mother Nature. Um, but we have not received, um, I, I think that uh, we would all agree that uh, an expenditure of that magnitude um, warrants a full hearing um, before this committee. Um, it would certainly affect um, East uh, River Park, John V. Lindsay Park, and I think other parks in the community. And um, so we're going to hear that. And uh, I'm also hoping to hold a February hearing uh, with the Women's Committee on the lack of statues for women, um, honoring women in New York City parks. There are only five. Uh, my math tells me in New York City is almost 400 years old, so we're doing about one statue for a woman every 78 years or so. I think we can certainly do better. Uh, we have announced that there will be a statue for uh, the late great uh, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm outside Prospect Park in Brooklyn, but um, I know that we can do better and we'll be looking at that, I hope, um, in the month of February. And um, with that, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of myself uh, all the staff members here, uh, our council, Chris Arturi, Patrick Mulvihill, uh, my council, Steve Bihar, Monica, whose name I will get sooner or later, her last name, our new budget uh, person, uh, my budget person, Daniela Era, Steve Bihar, my council, and my other colleagues that are still here to wish everybody uh, a very, very Merry Christmas, a Happy Kwanzaa. I hope you had a good Hanukkah and uh, a Happy New Year. and. Let's hope that 2019 is the best year ever for our New York City parks. And with that, I close this hearing at 221.